Welcome to St Wilfrid's Church Online. It's great to have you here with us today. As we start, let's say together, God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. We're here to worship God, to hear and to be inspired by his word. What, what does he want to say to us today? And we're here to pray. The thing is, Church Online is not about viewing a TV show. It's about engaging with God together, even though we are apart. Our theme today is pressing on towards the goal. St Paul writes about this in his letter to the Philippians, and we'll be reading from that letter later in the service. As Christians, God has given us hope and a purpose. We don't live aimlessly. He's given us his goal. So let's use our time today to allow the Holy Spirit to inspire us and to equip us to run that race. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you have given each of us a purpose, to be your sons and daughters, 
to become more like Jesus and to be your ambassadors to those around us. Inspire us by your Spirit, we pray, that we may grow in what it means to be your disciples, to run our race of life led by you, and to see others' lives changed through knowing you for themselves. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is Great is Thy Faithfulness. The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. We've all fallen short. None of us have met God's perfect standard. We all need God's forgiveness. So let's come to him now, he who is full of compassion, and confess our failings. Let's believe that when we are truly sorry, the Bible calls this repentance. God will forgive us and he will renew us. So let's pray. Lord God, we have sinned against you. 
we have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the God of love bring you back to himself, forgive you your sins and assure you of his eternal love in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
In today's collect or special prayer, we pray that God will challenge us with his truth. That can sometimes be difficult as God knows us better than we know ourselves. We also pray that we might trust God's love, which is perfect and never fails. We are asking God to help us to be completely open to him, to trust him fully, and then to live with confidence for him each day. We can't pray this prayer without meaning it. I hope that you can pray it now with me. God, our judge and saviour, Teach us to be open to your truth and to trust in your love, that we might live each day with confidence in the salvation which is given. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And let's declare our faith in God who we trust, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. We believe in God the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Today's Bible reading is read by David. Denise, Jonathan and Elaine will then bring us their thoughts and reflections. Today's reading is taken from the letter to the Philippians, chapter 3, beginning to read at verse 12. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which, has, for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things, and if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. Don't be fooled by the fancy dress. I was never that sporty. But I did always consider myself averagely fit. That was until about 16 years ago when I was late for the last post, so I decided I'd had to run to the letterbox at the end of the road. I missed the last post. That's when I realised I was getting old, it was downhill from now on, and I realised this really useful lesson in life. I was going to have to use it or lose it. So I joined a running club. The short old lady, always near the back, I'd never win a race, but I was still beating all those people who stayed at home. And I did run the occasional 5k or 10k and even twice the Great South Run. I was near the back okay, but the atmosphere was amazing. The sense of achievement, bands playing, crowds cheering me on, the sense of comedy as we were all on the race together, and the amazing feeling as I ran across, well, okay, as I staggered across the finishing line. And I got this bunch of medals. I'd like to present them to you as my gold, my silver and my bronze, but actually they're all pretty tinny. Everybody got one just for running the race. 
But my goal became not to be the one that won, but just to be the best I could be. And what about my Christian goals? As a Christian, I find myself having a prayerful chat with Jesus in the morning, talking to him about my goals, to be more like him, to make the world around me a bit more heavenly for those I share it with, to trust in Jesus for my ultimate destination. But of course, I fail. Tired, grumpy, selfish, all these things get in the way of my goals. In today's Bible passage, Paul uses the imagery of a runner well known to him from the Roman Marathon. People who were at the top of their game, the best that there was. And he speaks in terms of persevering to the end, pressing on to reach their goal of eternal life with Jesus. Oh, it sounds jolly hard work, doesn't it? A bit disheartening, really, because I'm not that good. So does this imagery work for me? Well, yes, it does. Why? When I go running, the finishing line just seems to get further and further away as my legs tire and my body flags. But with the Christian race, it's not like that. Jesus doesn't sit at the other end of the finishing line, twiddling his thumbs and waiting for us to get there. In fact, God twigged long ago that for us mere mortals, his finishing line was unachievable. So when Jesus died for us on the cross, he picked up the goalposts and he ran with them towards us. Or in the words of the famous prodigal son story, we have a God who runs out to meet his returning son. Of course, we have to play our part. Of course, we have to work at it. And we have to pick ourselves up and try again when we fail. And we will fail. We also have to actually start off on the course in the first place to trust that ultimately it is the joyful course. But Jesus has run the course before us. He's also in the crowds cheering us from the sidelines. He's the signpost pointing the way. He's the front runner leading us on. And he's the tail runner shepherding us along when we flag. And at the end, he's the one running towards us still with that finishing line. I suspect Paul's marathon runners would have considered that was cheating. But it's just God's grace. And there really is a medal in it at the end for all of us. And it's not tinny. So what for me is the main message of this passage? I think I come back to the place I was in 16 years ago when I tried and failed to beat the last post. If you've got enough faith to want to meet Jesus, even if that faith is as tiny as a mustard seed, use it or lose it. Jesus does the rest. Amen. In today's reading, Paul is talking about how life as a Christian is like a race. He says that you need to keep on going, completely focused on reaching a finish line. As Christians, we need Jesus to guide us along the race and to help each other on the way, as it is not always easy being a Christian. But that doesn't mean we should quit. Paul also says that there is far more to life for us, and we are citizens of heaven. This means we need to live thinking about the goal, and that there is something a lot better coming next. Good morning, everyone. I don't know about you, but I've never won a race. Not even the egg and spoon race at the school sports day. But I do know that there can be several reasons why we don't win races. Firstly, well, we don't win races if we don't enter them. Secondly, winners are a determined bunch and we may not have that particular mindset. And thirdly, we don't train enough. We don't push ourselves towards the winning post, the goal. Several times in the New Testament, the Christian life is pictured as a race. And in our reading this morning, Paul uses that picture to describe his own spiritual experience. He gives us some principles for spiritual growth, or to use a sporting analogy, how to get into shape spiritually so that we can run to win the race set before us. So to go grow as Christians, you've got to be in the race, have the proper attitude and give it the proper effort. Let's look at 
a bit more at each of these statements in order to press on in the race towards the goal. So firstly, to grow as a Christian, you've got to be in the race. This may sound perfectly obvious, but in reality, there are a lot of us trying to run in a race we've never entered. Maybe we're trying to grow as Christians by leading good lives and doing what Christians are supposed to do, but we never truly become Christians in the first place. Paul himself, before his Damascus Road experience, thought that he was doing everything he needed in order to be pleasing to God. He was sincere, he was dedicated, he was zealous and energetic, but there was one major problem. He was not genuinely converted to Jesus Christ. Paul refers to it in verse 2, 12. He's speaking here of his effort in the Christian race, but he makes clear that behind this effort is the foundational fact that he was first apprehended by Jesus Christ. I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Paul says that the reason he runs in this race is because Jesus chased him down, took hold of him and put him in the race. Paul was heading for Damascus to persecute Christians, but the Lord took hold of him, turned him round, so that he then became began serving Jesus. I wonder, do you truly know that you've been taken hold of? Have you grasped the truth that you've been called by Jesus? So turn to the sporting analogy again. Some of you may know that my second son, Tim, is a good hockey player. He's played for many years at a high level and his job is now coaching hockey at a large independent school and coaching juniors at a London-based club. During a game, Tim might call a player and say to him or her, I want you to go into the game. So the player is in the game because Tim, as the coach, has called him into the game. The player gives it their best effort to please the coach who called him to play. So the Christian life begins not with the weakness of a human decision to follow God, but with God's powerful calling of us and laying hold of our lives. This means that no Christian is his own person. We belong to Jesus Christ who bought us. The reason we're in the race is because Christ grabbed us and said, I want you to run for me. Because he took hold of us, we need to give it all we've got. So our growth is a process that stems from the very real awareness of being taken hold of by Jesus. In John's Gospel, we hear of Jesus speaking to the disciples and Jesus puts it this way. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you may go fruit. So we as the chosen ones need to be the branches attached to that vine. To grow as a Christian. We've got to be in the race because Christ took hold of our life. And this is foundational to all else. So then secondly, to grow as a Christian, we've got to have the proper attitude. Any athlete will tell you that attitude is often the difference between victory and defeat. A team that lacks in raw talent can sometimes defeat a team with much more ability because they have the right attitude going into the game. Attitude is crucial in the spiritual life as well. Two strands of Paul's attitude come through in these verses. He views Christian growth as a lifelong process. He has a long haul attitude. And he views Christian growth as the kind of thing where you can never say, I've arrived. You have to keep moving ahead. Paul had been converted for at least 25 years when he wrote the letters to the Philippians. There's no question that he's one of the outstanding believers of all times. Yet over and over, he wants us to know that he was still a work in progress. He keeps, keeps saying things like, not that I've already obtained all this. I do not consider myself yet taking hold of it. Twice he says, I press on. He's still straining towards as a runner stretches towards the finish line. He's been at it for 25 years, but he doesn't view himself as arrived. We need to take on board that the Christian life isn't a hundred yard dash. 
it's a lifelong marathon. And we need the mentality of a long distance runner if we're going to meet it, make it. We may have been a Christian for 40 or 50 years, but we can't start thinking, I don't need to grow anymore and stop running. Long distance runners have to complete the entire course. They can't decide after many miles that they've run far enough. This attitude of viewing Christian growth as a lifelong process is crucial for at least two reasons. First, we all have the human tendency to want quick fixes, easy answers to difficult problems, just like we want the current situation to be over now. But there's no quick, easy, instantaneous way to get in top physical conditioning. You have to work at it every day. And the day you stop is the day you start going downhill. Olympic champions who retire do not stay in shape for the rest of their lives because of their former training. They have to keep working it out all their lives. And it's the same spiritually. I wonder if you've been keeping yourself spiritually fit during this lockdown period, or have you become flabby and sluggish? How's your relationship with Jesus going? Another reason why it's important to maintain this attitude is that the Christian growth is a long life process, is that it ent enables us to be gracious and patient with one another. If we remember that growth is lifelong and that even Paul admits that he hasn't arrived after 25 years, we can bear with one another and be gracious to those who are still struggling with problems, even after many years of being Christians. If anyone could think he'd arrived, it would have been Paul. But he has always kept in mind that he wasn't there yet. He didn't want to rest on his laurels or to start coasting. Remember, this is a man who had numerous visions of the Lord. He'd been caught up to heaven and seen many things that no other living person had seen. He'd written some of the most profound theology ever penned. But his attitude was, I need to keep moving ahead. Paul's attitude of always moving ahead means forgetting the past reaching toward the future and pressing on in the presence. Forgetting what is behind. Again, the picture is of a runner who doesn't make the mistake of looking over his shoulder. His eyes are fixed on the goal. If he, makes, uh, if he made mistakes earlier in the race, he doesn't kick himself by replaying them in his mind. If he did well, he doesn't gloat about it. He leaves the path behind and keeps moving on towards the finish line. Paul means here that we should not be controlled by the past. We don't drive forward by constantly looking in the rear view mirror. We drive by looking ahead out of the windscreen. Yes, it's helpful to take occasional glances in your mirror, to use the information to make decisions about how to drive safely in the present and the future. But if we spend too much time looking in our mirror, we'll probably crash because we're not paying attention to the present. In the same way, we need to take periodic glances backwards. But we also need to put the past, good and bad, behind us. Accept God's grace and enabling for the present and move on with what he's calling us to do now. We can become mature and the, more, and the mature Christian will share Paul's thinking that we haven't yet arrived and that we can and must keep growing. These are the kind of attitudes we must have if we're to grow as Christian. And my final point to grow as a Christian is we've got to give it the proper effort. We need the balance of God's word here. Some say God's word is sovereign and we don't need to do anything. Others say it's all up to us. Scripture says God is at work in you, so you work. It's both and and, not either or. 
the Christian life is an active cooperation with God. Paul's one thing that he says in verse 13 implies focused concentration and effort, but he sets aside distractions and works at keeping his mind on the goal of knowing Christ and becoming more like him. A runner in a race can't afford to admire the scenery or look at the people on the sidelines. An Olympic champion is not a person of many interests who dabbles at his sports when it's convenient. Every day he gets up, puts his mind on the goal to win the gold medal. Everything else, his social life, his schedule, his diet, takes second place to the overall goal. The question each of us needs to answer is, do I devote myself to knowing Christ and being like him in the same way that an athlete devotes himself to winning the race? Does Christ growing in him consume me or do I dabble at it when it's convenient? If we want to grow, we've got to put our full effort into it, not just occasionally, but all the time. So to conclude, like Paul in prison, right up to the end, we should desire to be growing more and more Christ-like day by day. A bit like the mountain climber whose epitaph was, he died climbing. That ought to be true of every Christian. If we want, if we grow as a Christian, we need to make sure we're in the right race, that Christ has laid hold of our life and saved us from sin. We need to make sure that we've got the right attitude, that we haven't yet arrived, but we're in the lifelong process of moving ahead. And lastly, we need to give it the proper effort, focusing on the goal of being like Christ and doing everything in the light of that calling. Amen. Thank you to Denise, Jonathan and Elaine. As I've been reflecting on today's reading and what it means to run the race called Living as a Christian, a song came to mind. It's not a song that we sing. So we're going to watch a video and a big thank you to our friends at New Wine for letting us show it. Let's use this as an opportunity to commit ourselves afresh to God and the goal he is leading us towards. surrender all I'm living for your glory on the earth this passion in my heart this stirring in my soul to see the nations bow for all the world to know I'm living for your glory Take a blue open like 
and Lily will now lead us in our prayers. There is a response to today's prayers. When we say, Lord, for which you have called, please join in responding, if you are able, with help us to press on toward the goal. Let us pray to God, who alone makes us dwell in safety, for all who are affected by coronavirus through illness or isolation or anxiety, that they may find relief and recovery. Lord, for which you have called, help us to press on toward the goal. We pray for those who are guiding our nation at this time and shaping national policies that they make wise decisions. Lord, for which you have called, Help us to press on toward the goal. We pray for doctors, nurses and medical researchers that through their skill and insight may will many, many will, be, will restored be restored to health. to health. Lord, for which you have called, help us to press on towards the goal. Lord, we pray for the vulnerable and fearful within our community, for the gravely ill and the dying, that they may know your comfort and peace. Lord, for which you have called, help us to press on toward the goal. Lord, we pray for homes and families, our schools and young people, and all in any kind of need or distress. Lord, for which you have called, help us to press on towards the goal. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Encourage us to forget what is behind and strive forward toward what is ahead. Give us strength and guidance to press on towards the goal so that we may win the prize for which you have called us heavenward in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let us share together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you to everybody who prayed this last Wednesday, who got involved in our day of prayer. Now, I believe that God is guiding us through these rather challenging times. Jesus is still building his church, even if we can't always see it. And I think what he's doing now is digging the groundworks for what he's going to do. And this really came up when we prayed together, this sense that God is doing something deep and powerful. But also the sense that it's now time for us, each of us, to dig deep roots in our lives, those firm foundations based on God himself. We were challenged on Wednesday to get our own houses in order. Are we living in the way that God calls us to? Someone had a picture of God guiding us as we walk through a forest where there's no clear paths that he will lead us out to the other side. So we must look to God and not be overwhelmed. Somebody else had a picture of a sheep pen with a sheep that's lost, that couldn't find its way. Now God is the shepherd, but he calls each of us to work with him in bringing others into his pen. Now thank you to everybody who's, who sent me their thoughts. I've had a number of emails and messages this week with people just sharing what they believe God might be saying. Thank you to you all. They are all important. They're all being collated and we're not going to lose any of this. Please keep praying and keep sharing what you think God is saying here. What is he wanting us to be and to do as his expression of church here in Cowplay?
We'll be back for church online next Sunday at the same time of 10.45. We're continuing with morning prayer at 9.30am weekdays on Zoom and our Bible study will return on Wednesday at 7.30pm. As ever, please don't forget Faith Stories at 4pm Fridays on Facebook and YouTube. On Thursday the 22nd of October we are holding our APCM, our annual meeting. It's at 7.30pm and due to Covid we're doing things differently this year. We're holding the meeting in church and also on Zoom. In church you will need to wear a face mask and seating will be socially distanced. Please contact Val if you would like to book a seat. Sorry, but in these strange times we need to keep track of numbers. And if you attend on Zoom, assuming you are on our electoral roll, you will be able to fully participate. We'll be using our usual Zoom logon details, so please email vicar at stwilfridscowplain.co.uk if you don't have it. We will be keeping things short, but Ian will be saying a little about how we see the current situation and what God is saying to us. So please put this date in your diary. This last Friday, Jack Williams was ordained at All Saints Denmead, where he's now serving as curate. Now I know that so many of you will have known Jack over the years, and it's wonderful to see someone from St Wilfrid's God has called to be ordained to become a minister in the church. So please do continue to pray for Jack, Charlie and Caleb as they settle into this new way of life and particularly for Jack as he starts his new ministry. But please don't forget that God calls each of us. So how is he calling you? Is there something that he's asking you to do? Now it might be within the church, but equally it might be something quite different, something in the world around you that he has called you to. Please, please don't leave it if you sense that God is speaking to you. I'd love to have a chat with you. Please do get in touch. May the love of the Lord Jesus draw you to himself. The power of the Lord Jesus strengthen you in his service. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. If you're watching live, do now join us on Zoom for coffee.
while we're 